Uh, thank you, Dr. Kolo, for that very informative presentation. Uh, now I'll pass the microphone on to Dr. Tim Anderson, which I'm sure needs no introduction. So I'll let him continue once he's ready. Good morning, folks. Nice to see you all this morning. Uh, really enjoyed the conference so far. Um, I want to talk on something a little bit more specific here, but first I just want to answer Drew briefly that I love history. I love imperialism. <laughs> it's great. I just think that sometimes some of us in the left tradition with Marxist traditions sometimes overemphasize the logic of power. We have to also look at the logic of resistance. So it's very important to study the logic of imperialism, but we also have to put that together with logic of resistance, because resistance sometimes shifts the great, the best known plans of the powerful. Now, in this study, I want to do, use a little history to look at one aspect of the conflict, which is humanitarian war. Um, I suggest there's two real logics or two sets of pretexts driving this war on Syria. One has been to do with humanitarian intervention, which has a long history in the liberal side of imperialism, of Western imperialism. And the other one is to do with maybe you could call it neorealist um, uh, intervention in the name of protective intervention. That is to say, the US goes in there because there's all these crimes and it has to protect people from crimes. Humanitarian intervention. The, the US goes in in the war of terror to protect the world from global terrorism, which it, it itself has initiated to provide a pretext. So protective intervention, you have to go against the war on terror, the war on ISIS, and the humanitarian intervention to stop all of these terrible dictatorships in the world who aren't within its sphere of control. So I want to focus on the humanitarian intervention um, in this presentation. Um, and I'm going to skip over this. We know, of course, that in you know, these pretexts, really every war in, in my memory, you know, from Vietnam to the current wars, have been based on false pretexts, and these are very famous, and we can and should study them. Um, in more recent times, uh, this humanitarian intervention, uh, and the basis of these pretexts is in the current era, or let's say in the post-World War II era, or the United Nations era, where there's the United Nations Charter and the recognition and sovereignty of states, and the basic prohibition against the intervention and sovereignty of states, is to create some sort of exception that gets around international law. It's blatantly illegal in violation of the most fundamental principles of human rights to intervene, to invade in a country, to provide arms to proxy armies, to overthrow governments in a war of aggression, which is considered you know, that the, the fundamental war crime is a war of aggression. The war of aggression carried out against Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, South Lebanon, uh, Libya, Syria, they're all wars of aggression prohibited by international law by the United Nations, the Security Council created specifically to prevent war there, but in, in practice, of course, it hasn't done it. But the pretext, what pretext is to be used? Now, in the case of humanitarian intervention, and maybe this sounds a little uh, uh, counterintuitive to Western people who are used to thinking of liberalism as a, a, a softer force and a, uh, something that has tempered Western imperialism um, that compared to, say, the, the realist interventions of the Trumps and the Bushes of the world and the Reagans of the world and so on. Um, there's a very strong tradition of humanitarian intervention. If we go back to John Stuart Mill, the famous British liberal of the mid-19th century. He was part of a very strong current in liberalism. You know, his most famous book was on liberty, about the, the liberty of the individual and, and the state, the state not to inter intervene in individual freedoms and so on. Uh, he was also a creature of the British Empire at that time. He didn't believe in, in independence of the colonies. He didn't believe in the independence of India in particular. The biggest colony in human history was India, you know, which encompassed Bangladesh and Pakistan and Sri Lanka and Burma and so on at the time. So Mill wrote that colonization was the best affairs of business in which the capital of an old and wealthy country can engage. It was a civilizing influence. Um, it was going to, in the best view of things, it was going to convert barbarian tribes, as the Romans had put it before, and the, and the British learned a lot from the Romans. Um, the same rules of international morality, morality do not apply between civilized nations and barbarians. 
The British are drawing directly on the Romans here, as they drew on the Romans for divide and rule in the colonies, because how could the British ever dominate India? India is a massive, a massive um, country. <coughs> Barbarians have no rights as a nation, John Stuart Mill said, the famous liberal. And uh, indeed, a lot of the self-conscious intellectual defences of interventions since the invasion of Afghanistan. The invasion of Afghanistan is sort of the turning point here in terms of the, the renovation of liberal imperialism because, after all, the invasion of Afghanistan was blatantly illegal, never mind the invasion of Iraq later on. There was no mandate uh, in international law. There was no justification in international law for the invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, Wikipedia said there was because Wikipedia was copying the US media, basically. Um, but uh, really what the UN Security Council authorised at that time was a, a intervention to uh, get the suspects for the atrocities in New York in September 2001. Not to destroy the country and whatever you thought of the Taliban government to uh, overthrow that government. So the international law and the foundation of the Bill of Human Rights these days are predicated in the post-colonial era on the self-determination of states first and then, um, and then uh, and then peoples after. Peoples significantly because peoples included colonised peoples and indigenous peoples. So from the Declaration of Decolonisation in December 1960, and I like to point out you know, in, in my classes that it, no one opposed this Declaration on Decolonisation, the end of the colonial era. There was no justification for colonisation, the occupation and administration of other people's nations, um, even the justification that they were not prepared for it educationally because colonisation had not educated their children and so on, uh, was not allowed. And the principle of the self-determination of peoples in that declaration went straight into Article 1 of the International Bill of Rights in 1966. Ask the people, the Western advocates of human rights intervention these days, what the first principle of the International Bill of Rights is, and they won't be able to tell you. They don't know what it is. They don't understand human rights. It's the self-determination of peoples which the UN then explained after that was to do the foundational principle of human rights above and beyond all the others and on the basis of which we were able to protect and, and, uh, human rights within those countries, the rights of people to all of their rights. So when the justifications since, let's say, post Rwanda 1994 for intervention as a new, a new wave, it was really drawing on as this... Uh, Gary Bass writes in his article, Freedom's Battle, drawing precisely on liberal imperialism for the 19th century uh, uh, to, uh, on the one hand, look at that history where the British, for example, used their occupation of India justified on the, the, the claim that they were going to abolish bride burning, for example, sati and so on, that they were going to intervene to abolish slavery in certain countries, which they, in other countries, for example, after they themselves had dismantled that slavery. The current justifications are to do with great crimes that are so enormous, genocide, crimes against humanity, uh, ethnic cleansing, um, and so on, that would create an exceptional justification for humanitarian intervention, which was crystallised into a doctrine called the, uh, the responsibility to protect in the early 20th century, the responsibility to protect, which is very popular now if you want to write it in academic journals and international affairs, you can't really write about imperialism, this is sort of old school Marxism stuff, it's about fragile states and, you know, state building with outside powers doing it and the responsibility to protect, you know, the gatekeepers in academia will do all this sort of thing, this is one of the reasons why we created the, 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 the Centre for Counter Hegemonic Studies, to let's look again at imperialism and at self-determination and resistance, basically. But if you look at the, the writings of the Jewish man who wrote about, who created the term genocide in the 1930s and 40s, the Polish Jew Raphael Lemkin, he talks about a recurring pattern of history which was carried about by empires. That genocide, slavery and colonialism, the great crimes of past millennia were all carried out by the big powers so they could dominate and take over other people's nations, other people's lands. Um, so, um, you know, to, for the great powers in the 21st century to use the pretext of crimes against humanity and genocide is to reverse that historical understanding of where those great crimes came from. Okay, let me move forward into um, what I want to talk about really, which is that 
the human rights industry during the dirty, dirty war in Syria, which is really one of the major currents or pretexts for intervention in Syria, um, along with that protective intervention, you know, to, to, to overcome the global threat of terrorism. The reports that have been used for the last six years and the recent chemical weapons uh, stories, we shouldn't really, I don't want to spend too much time on them because they are repetitive of at least two dozen similar incidents in the past six years. So, you know, it's like the police go and catch someone for a break and enter in the suburb down the road. They look at the other, the other 20 break and enters in the same area. The criminal's pattern of behaviour at a certain stage can be used against the criminal. We don't have to prove every false flag incident in this war because the pattern of the criminal is so consistent and so consistently proven that uh, at a certain stage you say, just a minute, we are not going to even enter into this in a great deal of detail because we can use in criminal law doctrine the, the pattern of behaviour. The reports on these incidents, on the, the recent incident, are so one-sided. This is I'm talking about the chemical weapons incident in, in Khan Sheikhun, for example. They're so one-sided. They're driven from within the aggressor states. By the way, the United States doesn't consider itself a, a partisan player in this in this war, even though it's very well known that at least 80% of all the weapons used by ISIS al Nusra and the rest of them are American weapons. Um, but it considers itself as a, an adjudicator. Here's the double standards of imperialism that comes in. There are massive investments from corporate America in the agencies that promote these sorts of stories, and there's little sense of conflict of interest. Uh, so, for example, the UN Human Rights Commission on Syria since 2012, after they dismantled the UN Special Mission in Syria, is co-chaired by an American diplomat, Karen uh, Koning Abu Zaid. She's married to a North African man. So, Ban Ki-moon, when he appointed this American diplomat to, sorry, US diplomat to uh, this commission, didn't have any sense of a conflict of interest here. By that time, the US was already providing arms to whatever they wanted to call them, moderate rebels or secular revolutionaries or whatever. The US was a player in the armed conflict in Syria by the time this US diplomat was appointed to chair this commission. So it's not an independent commission. Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, which I want to spend a little time on, uh, because we've got two categories of so-called NGOs in this campaign, in this propaganda war, uh, are agencies that existed before the Syrian war, but have been co-opted into the Syrian war in rather different ways. I want to spend some time on that. There are some other agencies that were created specifically for this war, the Syria Campaign, the Wall Street Group, the White Helmets, the Fake Civil Defence Group, and so on. I want to talk a little bit about them. But uh, just in general principles at, at the start, the sources, the sources have been almost entirely partisan and derivative. Uh, I'll mention a bit of the detail in a moment. The Syrian Observatory of Human Rights in, in, the, in the UK. There's some other one, uh, a, uh, a network on human rights, some anonymous activists and so on. So we've propagating these stories and picked up by the colonial media, as Paul says, the corporate media, the state media. Um, Colonial because they're using colonial ideas to talk about intervention as though it's simply something that's natural and part of the system. They have normalised war in the last 15 years. That's the worst thing that's been done about the colonial media since the invasion of Afghanistan, since the long war in the Middle East, which is, was aimed at the overthrow of seven governments and has come more or less ground to a halt because of the resistance in Syria and the friends of Syria that came in to uh, resist Syria. But nevertheless, the last 15 years, the greatest evil that's been done in terms of the general discussion has been to normalise war. War is just a normal course of events. The United Nations was created to stop war. Um, so uh, these ideas of you know great crimes and so on are really meaningless in a in a legal sense, in international law sense, unless the state is crushed, unless Yugoslavia is destroyed, and then they can get some Yugoslav leader uh, leader into the into the uh, International Criminal Court, which is so far only for Africans, apparently. Apparently only Africans commit war crimes these days. Or, um, or they can destroy Libya and get some of uh, the murdered leaders' children into the, into the International Criminal Court. Uh, Human Rights uh, Watch, for example, um, which I'll come to in a moment, um, a bunch of uh, intellectuals and Nobel Peace laureates said many years ago, close your revolving door to the US government because in recent times 
the officials from the US State Department and Human Rights Watch, also Amnesty International in the US, have been simply coming and go between each other. Here are these, um, some of these sources I'm talking about, and you'll see them repeated in the corporate media. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, it's one man sitting in Coventry, England, paid by, US, uh, by UK intelligence, as he admits, um, and flying the flag of the Free Syrian Army, you know, the armed group, so obviously a partisan source, obviously a partisan source, used repeatedly, I mean hundreds, probably thousands of times, to justify the latest stories about Syria. And you know, with some supposed body count, which comes out of, you know, year 20 children and 50 women, something or other, numbers, numbers that come out of the air. This other guy, which I probably wrongly said was Iranian, Fadil Abdul Ghani, who runs this other outfit, basically, but similar sort of thing. Um, interesting, when you look into this Syrian network for human rights, they admit on their method that they can't really determine anything about what's going on in Syria, strangely enough. But nevertheless, you get a huge a, a, a amount of numbers about casualties and so on from that body. So those agencies are used by the United Nations Commission, chaired by a US diplomat. They're used by Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and the US State Department. And then the US State Department will say, well, here are these credible sources saying those sorts of things. So if you track back sources on these stories, you'll come to these sorts of characters who are embedded with the armed groups. Human Rights Watch. Now, Human Rights Watch was created in uh, the late 80s by the Carter administration in the US um, as Helsinki Watch, which was an agency to supposedly document the crimes of the Soviet Union at that time, the human rights abuses of the Soviet Union, let's say, bolstered by Alexander Solzhenitsyn and others at the time. Um, so that agency, uh, really, Human Rights Watch is a big PR agency. Um, it's a multi-million dollars, it's hundreds of million dollars PR agency. Um, the head of it, uh, Philip Roth, um, has been the head of it for more than 20 years. It's not an NGO, although it's not funded by the government. It's funded by big US foundations. Um, George Soros, with his Open Society Foundation, gave it $100 million seven years ago, $100 million before the Arab <coughs> Spring period, for example. There's no real democracy in it, um, like there's no real democracy in Amnesty International. Amnesty International is, has a different sort of history, which I'll come to, but in Human Rights Watch, um, it, was, it began as uh, the focus on the Soviet Union. Then it moved into Latin America in a big way, um, and guess who all the human rights targets were in Latin America? Cuba. Venezuela, Bolivia, Ecuador. Now, all, of the, all of the targets of the US foreign policy uh, was what Human Rights fo focused on. The Latin Americans rallied against this. Um, a similar thing, by the way, happened with Amnesty International, but um, it, the focus was all there. They didn't focus on Colombia, the worst human rights abuser in South America, uh, with death squads, killing journalists, killing trade unions, and so on. There wasn't a focus on Colombia by Human Rights Watch. It was about Venezuela, it was about Chavez, and there was an open campaign against Chavez when Chavez was uh, one of the most popular politicians in, in Latin America. Now, one thing that, here's a little, a minor scandal, let's say, um, not so minor in the sense that the, a number of the, the Zionist groups in the US picked up this issue and tried to compare it to the Holocaust, which to me is a horrible thing for a Jewish person to do. An actual horrendous crime, the Holocaust of the Jewish people um, in the mid 20th century, to compare their claims against Syria. This one was, it happened about the time, just after the time I did my first visit to Syria, that a defector from uh, Syria went to Qatar. Uh, obviously, he's, he was kept anonymous. He had photos from a morgue from a hospital in Damascus, photos from a morgue of dead bodies, right? photos from a morgue during wartime um, in a hospital, a military hospital, which we visited, which we gave some money to, in fact, a couple of years ago. They were said to be thousands of prisoners killed by the Syrian government, tortured and killed in, in Syrian hospitals. So this man, they codenamed Caesar, they didn't say who he was, he had no corroboration. They said that Qatar hired some British lawyers who went out and said, oh, fair enough, seems to be credible. <laughs> they paid him a lot of money and they went away. They started showing these pictures of dead bodies um, through the US. And uh, no one knew much more about it because they didn't release the total file. They re released a few dozen photographs. They didn't release the thousands of photographs. Apparently there was 53,000 photographs uh, of bodies, for the most part with 
uh, numbers and so on, and most of them correlated and were, were indeed linked to that hospital by some uh, satellite imagery and so on. Most of them, not necessarily all of them, but most of them. Um, they were all said to be uh, these mass deaths and tortures in serious detention facilities, you know, what do they call it, industrial scale of killing and so on. They were shown throughout the US in a sort of a travelling road show. They were highlighted by a Holocaust Museum by Zionist groups in the US also. A year later, Human Rights Watch, this body I've been talking about, uh, released a report saying more or less the same thing. All, of, all the, the front stories was the Assad's killing machine and so on and so on. Page two to three. Page two to three. These were the people who got access to the full file, which we hadn't had access to. Page two to three showed 24,500 of those photos, 40 something percent of them, showed dead army soldiers or members of the security forces and crime scene photographs taken in the aftermath of attacks from the aftermath of explosions, assassination of security officers, fires and car bombs. There in one paragraph they said, admitted, that people don't read beyond the first page, they don't read beyond the first page, admitted that almost half of them, before we do any other analysis of what was going on there, that almost half of them were security forces and other victims of crime. But the headline says they were all tortured opposition people. This was Human Rights Watch. Human Rights Watch was an important sort of foundation for um, the early story, the narrative on Syria, that there were peaceful protests for the first six months, that the regime attacked peaceful protests for ages and eventually they had to take up arms to defend themselves and their communities and so on. That was how the, the general narrative went. And so Human Rights Watch wrote in a report in early 2012, the protest movement was overwhelmingly peaceful until September 2011, exactly what the Obama White House had said. Now, one thing to be borne in mind by Human Rights Watch is that um, Soros is funded enormously. It's been funded by US foundations. It is generally, though, not funded by the US government. Uh, the history of Human Rights Watch is that it's very deeply embedded in Democrat politics, so one side of the politics there. So they were a little bit critical of the Bush invasion of Iraq, for example. Um, they're a little bit standoffish of the Trump administration now. But under the Clinton administration, under the Obama administration, completely lockstep there. In fact, under the Clinton administration in the final year, in 2012, uh, a Human Rights Watch director, I think her name was Holly Burkhalter, uh, Human Rights uh, Director, wrote the white paper for the US State Department on Humanitarian Intervention, the year 2000, uh, with the Clinton administration. So that type of uh, exchange between US State Department, at least under Democrat administrations, uh, and human rights Watch officials was going there. Now, the reason we know the Human Rights Watch claim about the beginnings of the Syrian conflict are false is because we have independent witnesses of it. I mean, Professor Jeremy Salt, probably the leading Australian academic on Middle Eastern history, contemporary Middle Eastern history, but working out of Ankara in Turkey for the last 20 years, said very early in the piece in October 2011 um, that uh, the killings of soldiers, police and civilians had been going on virtually since the beginning. If you read um, the journalist Shami Nawani, um, she was one of the main people to document all of those killings um, going on in, in Homs in particular uh, and Italy uh, a little bit later on. Uh, large numbers of, um, of uh, Syrian army, Syrian security force victims such that at the end of the first year of conflict, the UN would kept the body count in the first year from a variety of sources, uh, said in, in early 2012 that the people killed in the first year of conflict were about half Syrian security forces and half others. Basically. So in fact, the killing was um, pretty much, uh, it showed that there was a serious war going on in the first year. Here's this man murdered by Jabhat al-Nusra in Homs, um, a Jesuit priest. Uh, who lived there for 40 years, said the same thing basically. Most citizens didn't support this opposition. You can't say it's a popular uprising from the beginning. It wasn't peaceful. There are some other journalists, um, Ala Jabba, for example, who wrote about the conflict in Idlib and how there were genuine political protests, but the, the, the Islamist uh, sectarian attacks drove those protests off the street. She writes about a demonstration in Idlib that was a large demonstration about the treatment of some people that were held by the government in June 2011 and uh, the President Bashar al-Assad disarmed the police going into that conflict, disarmed them, some people, some Syrians, I've heard some Syrians 
don't really forgive him for doing that. They were shot through the head by armed insurgents within that demonstration. The next week, when they call a demonstration, 300 people came along. So you can see in, in Idlib, in June 2011, from the reports by Hala Jabba, that a demonstration of 5,000 had gone to a demonstration of 300 within a week. That is how the political protest movement was driven off the streets and was uh, by the armed insurgency which took over. But the Human Rights Watch story you know, covers that up. Amnesty International, I'm going to spend most time on Human Rights Watch for Amnesty International. Amnesty International had a different history. Amnesty International started as a group that was writing letters for political prisoners. I remember in my mother's house in the 60s, my godmother and my mother were, were writing um, uh, a statement. Someone's got a cough and needs some water, I think. Who's got the cough? Give me, give me a minute. Um, and the main criticism that Amnesty got really in the 70s and 80s was that they were so apolitical, they wouldn't support Nelson Mandela. They wouldn't support Nelson Mandela because he was accused of acts of violence. So therefore, Nelson Mandela was never adopted as a prisoner of conscience <coughs> by Amnesty. But something changed with Amnesty International. Uh, so they were seen as conservative in a sense, that they didn't want to engage in politics. Something changed by the first Gulf War, 1990. Remember, a lot of you won't remember it, but you may have read about it. Um, the first Gulf War, which was uh, an intervention actually authorised by the Security Council on a legal basis because the state of Iraq, for whatever the historical injustices, uh, Saddam Hussein's Iraq had illegally invaded you know, the Kingdom of Kuwait and uh, there was that incident there. But the US public was reluctant to go to war against Saddam Hussein at that time. So Bush the I um, created a stunt to um, to enable the US to go to war against Saddam Hussein's Iraq at that time. There was a story uh, backed by a young woman who was said to be a nurse saying that Iraqi soldiers had gone into a hospital, they wanted to steal incubators, so they'd thrown all these babies, hundreds of babies, out onto the cold floor, let them to die to steal the incubators. That was such a moral outrage that it helped mobilize the US public behind, just like Trump's missile attack on Syria used a chemical weapon it mobilized the US public behind the president at that time and they sent uh, troops into Iraq and not only drove them out of Kuwait, but murdered tens of thousands of them retreating back into Iraq, which, for which there was no mandate. That nurse near it, Nayira, uh, it was a complete fake story which was exposed in the corporate media in the US soon after that. She was the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador. The Kuwait state had paid $11 million to a big PR form in PR firm in the US to, to tutor her in that, the story about the incubator babies. And Amnesty International backed that story. They said they had independent evidence corroborating that story, which was, which was discreet. So sometime 27 years ago, Amnesty was going in there, as they say, shilling for this intervention there. Um, cutting forward in that history, on the 10th anniversary of the invasion of Afghanistan, a, a woman who had worked in the Hillary Clinton State Department and moved across smoothly to be the, the director of Amnesty International in the US, this woman, Susan Nossel, did a campaign at a NATO meeting, I believe it was in Canada, um, that said, NATO, keep the progress going. So the military occupation of Afghanistan, um, which really, of course, it was sectored as a, a de facto, you know, a, a, a fait accompli that the, the country was occupied, um, was arguing on the basis of supposed protection of women and girls in Afghanistan uh, to support the military occupation of Afghanistan in 2012. Uh, they got a lot of criticism for that and uh, they tried to back their way out of it a little bit. But Amnesty began by running that argument which was actually first set up by George W. Bush's wife, Laura, and the Bush, the Bush Foundation you know, for Human Rights in Afghanistan uh, used precisely that pretext that you know it was good for the human rights of women and girls in Afghanistan for NATO to be occupying the country. The, the UNDP stats on, on women's rights within Afghanistan didn't really justify that. When the intervention, the NATO intervention in Libya took place, Amnesty International in France um, argued that uh, they had independent evidence showing indeed that Gaddafi was using his troops and using black mercenaries, in particular African mercenaries, to slaughter civilians, massacre civilians, to rape women, um, and what else were they saying? But some serious crimes. Amnesty International supported that, 
and after Gaddafi was killed and NATO bombed Libya, Amnesty admitted that they had no evidence to support that. You see a pattern coming here. The woman, uh, Donatella Rivera, who did that report, began the, a still the Amnesty Rapporteur on Syria. She has been into Syria apparently 10 times. There are no Amnesty International people in Syria, but she has been into Al Qaeda occupied Syria 10 times. Uh, and the reports by Amnesty International depend heavily on this woman who wrote those reports in Libya, which were proven as false. This woman, Genevieve Garagos, was saying, you know, on one hand, uh, Gaddafi was using foreign mercenaries to accelerate the repressive process. Um, after Gaddafi was murdered, today we must admit we have no evidence that Gaddafi employed mercenary forces in this video of her, of her saying these things. The Libyan leader that was installed after Gaddafi admitted that he didn't kill protesters at all. Even in a conservative journal, Foreign Affairs, in the US today, there's a very good article by a man who I may not have reference to here, who has documented this from US sources, from independent sources, that the claims against Gaddafi were quite false, that the number of people killed in Libya was about 1,000 before NATO intervened, of which 3% were women and children. So in other words, the civilian component of that was very small at that time. After NATO intervened, 10,000 people were killed. So a conservative journal in the US was able to say this because after Libya was destroyed, it didn't matter to them. Syria still matters to them. Syria still matters. They don't let that go. They even you find George W. Bush laughing, which makes jokes about the, the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They got what they wanted. They don't care about the, those things after the fact. They care about Syria. Here's the most recent one you may have seen um, a little bit earlier this year, a few weeks ago. Uh, Amnesty International, using the same sort of sources, and using this uh, one of that one of the sources that, uh, of the partisan sources I mentioned, says that there is a said that there was a prison in uh, in Sadnaya, which is a small town north of Damascus, mainly Christian town, where huge numbers of prisoners were executed. Now, prisoners are executed after trial in Syria because Syria still has the death penalty. They do execute people for terrorism. But here was a story that massive numbers of executions were taking place um, based on what they, they went and interviewed some people in Turkey. As I said, that Amnesty International has no one in, uh, in Syria. They admit it, except that woman and perhaps her team who have gone across the border illegally into, into Idlib and North Aleppo to talk to the armed groups. They, I've, put a bit of, I've repeated a bit of history here. So Amnesty didn't visit Syria for the report, nor would it be allowed in because of what they did in the past. It interviewed a few dozen people in Turkey. But the numbers that they use come mainly from the, that one of the partisan groups funded by George Soros, by US foundations, and by the US government. Uh, Amnesty said in their own, from their own interviews that the people in the armed groups in Turkey told them that hundreds, probably thousands, were killed in Sadnaya prison. Then they get the figures from this HRDAG a claim of 17,723 killed. Well, this is you know, very precise from a group that admitted that their method, by the way, I was reminded of what they said about their method. Admission, admissions are always interesting parts of evidence. Um, this Syrian Network for Human Rights, which was linked to that other one, the likelihood of documenting military victims from armed opposition is rather slim. Further, our group can't document victims from government forces due to the absence of a clear methodology. Official sources are extremely secretive, as are victims, families, and friends, while other difficulties, in other words, their data is pretty much useless in terms of an <laughs> sense. But they do a lot of detailed things, you know. In this case, 17,723 executions. Okay? Sounds impressive. So the embassy says, well, maybe there was between 5,000 and 13,000 killed. And we were saying hundreds, probably thousands, as they do with 17,000. We'll say 5,000 between 13,000. People are being executed, but where are these numbers coming from? So they made some criticism of terrorist groups in Syria, but they didn't criticize the US, the UK, the Saudis, for arming and financing terrorist groups, which they had admitted, the US Vice President, the US Head of the Armed Forces, Martin Dempsey, uh, had admitted that their allies have financed and armed ISIS and all of the other groups in the Middle East. Somehow or other, the US is not responsible for what the Saudis, the Qatar, and Turkey, and the others do, apparently. So this is, uh, those sources are being used by Amnesty um, to bolster their own interviews. Here's Amnesty in this country, 
um, a guy called Sam Hendricks, who's the media coordinator in Sydney, who says, uh, I asked him last year with the Aleppo campaign, they were, they, they were running on this Save Aleppo campaign, raising a lot of money for, you know, the victims of Aleppo because Al-Qaeda was being driven out of Aleppo. So this was, you know, the story of the fall of Aleppo according to the colonial media, the liberation of Aleppo according to most of the Middle Eastern media, basically. Um, he said, we don't have, currently have staff on the ground in Syria, it's not feasible, but our senior crisis response advisor, Don Hella Rivera, remember her from Libya? <laughs> crossing the border ten times and so on. Then I asked him, well, how's the Aleppo this year? After the liberation of Aleppo, how has Aleppo appeal money been used since the Syrian army liberated the city? <laughs> Nothing. It has disappeared. Aleppo has disappeared from Amnesty International website. If you go to the Amnesty International Australia website, Aleppo went there, basically. They raised tens of thousands of dollars. What have they done with it? They weren't in Aleppo. They were never in Aleppo. They couldn't do any humanitarian program in Aleppo at all. It was all about the media campaign, Save Aleppo. But where did that money go now? They haven't accounted for it. And I would suggest that anyone, anyone member of Amnesty International? Even if you aren't a member, we are entitled to... They use it to fund their operations. They use it to fund their operations, whatever. Whatever, yeah. But they were raising it for humanitarian relief in Aleppo, and they haven't used it for that. Very typical of many of these I haven't been there. The, the worldwide red protest, etc., etc. This was. I don't want to go into the Syrian hospital thing. That's a whole other story. That's even the white helmets. Um, here's another good one: the Syria campaign. Now, the Syria campaign is a, Wall, a literally Wall Street outfit created a, a couple of years ago through a little network of organisations linked to Avaz and um, Soros money, basically. There's a few young. Uh, let's say Australian Zionists who were involved in that have gone to New York for the purpose of this entrepreneurial thing. They funded a campaign in Germany um, uh, in, in 2015 and put out the press release saying 70% of refugees are fleeing Assad. They interviewed over 800 people, uh, you know, if we believe them, 800 and something, 890 people, Syrian refugees in four or five German cities and came out with a press release that said this basically. 70% of refugees are fleeing us up. Massive take-up, repeated in, in huge, huge uh, wide range of, um, they're very good at marketing people, people, much better than us. You know, people on the left, we're hopeless marketers, really. We write things, we can't sort of market them, but these people have got experience in it. So I at first looked at it, and I didn't actually read the survey myself, you know. When I went back a little bit later on and read it, there's nothing at all like that in this actual survey, which is public and online. The survey didn't ask them anything about fleeing Assad. The survey asked them who they were in fear of, which was a legitimate question. They had a number of leading questions which were a bit inappropriate. We don't know what their sampling process was, but we do know about their demographics because of some of the detail in the survey. Now, in the survey, first of all, their questions were, who are you afraid of? And 70%, around 70% were indeed afraid of the Syrian army, getting hit by the Syrian army. So in that sense, you could say it sort of seems to gel a little bit. But the problem is that 90% of them were afraid of being hit by the anti-government armed forces, 90%. Of which about 10% the Kurdish forces. So 80% were, and the Kurdish forces are by and large, despite what was said a little bit yesterday, the, the Kurdish forces are by and large cooperating with the Syrian army. But that is to say there aren't any serious conflicts there have been a couple of little conflicts, no serious conflicts between the Kurdish forces and the Syrian army. Most of the weapons the Kurdish forces have are from the Syrian Arab army. So, in other words, this 70% wasn't adding up to 100%. People could nominate several people of which they were afraid. So more, somewhat more were afraid of the anti-government forces than the government forces. Three quarters of them came from Al-Qaeda occupied areas, which, which really, um, in Syria, there's never been more than 10% of the population controlled in, in Al-Qaeda controlled areas, never more. The maps that show you slices of Syria include desert, the eastern desert. So to say that you know, this is 20 or 30 percent of, or 40 or 50 percent of Syria, you can't include the eastern desert, you have to talk about populated areas. In populated areas, Al-Qaeda groups have never controlled more than 10 percent. It's less than 5 percent now, less than 5 percent. So these people were three quarters from the Al-Qaeda occupied areas. They had reason to fear of being hit by the Syrian army in those. They were also three quarters young men between 16 and 40, 16 and 45. So they were very unrepresentative. If you look at the UN uh, Human Rights, uh, the, uh, the refugee, UNHCR, on the population of the four million refugees, 
they're pretty much 50-50 men and women. They're pretty much a, a spread of population there. The people in the survey were young men, mainly young men, three quarters young men from uh, those areas occupied by the Al-Qaeda groups. And they didn't say 70 percent were fleeing Assad, more of them feared the other armed groups. But most people, most journalists will not read past the press release, so they repeated the press release. So I'll give you that in a little bit of detail just to show you that um, if there's enough detail there, you can read between the lines. If the detail ain't there, you can't read between the lines. I mentioned this one, the, um, the, uh, the morgue photos. Here's a recent one from the UN Commission, created in 2012, that did uh, a fake report on the Hula massacre in 2012. By the way, in my book, The Dirty War on Syria, one of the reasons, things that motivated me was to look at the detail of some of these early false flag massacres, like the Hula massacre in, in early 2012. And um, in that case, um, going back to the Russian and the Dutch and the, the Arab sources there, um, you can find 15 people that identified individuals and leaders of the Fruit Brigade, local collaborators responsible for that massacre of people who were largely pro-state uh, in the Hula massacre. Um, but this commission, uh, co-chaired by the US diplomats, simply swept that all aside and said there was no real motive involved for it, except some sort of general sectarian violence, and no names at all for trying to blame it on the government. Now, the recent one from that same committee, which was about what the, ah, the liberation of Aleppo. Apparently the liberation of Aleppo was a war crime, according to this committee. <laughs> Not that they interviewed the people coming out of East Aleppo in December 2012, as did Carla Ortiz, Vanessa Bealey. Vanessa Bealey, in particular, if you want to look at Vanessa Bealey's interviews of people coming out with translators, she went and spoke to people, said she was really looking at the white helmets. Did you, did you see any white helmets there? Yes, they were only helping the armed groups. But there's a big compilation, actually, I think I've got it here. Yeah. Bit of it. It's actually a video by one of our friends, Steve Bessadine.
civil defense hospital and they gave her an injection filled with air to kill her. Look at this scene in Fadus, men with white helmets. They called the white helmets of the civil defense helping people when they were injured. Well, when they came to help the injured, they stole from them. If people were wearing jewelry, they cut it off. All of them were thieves. Some of them are honest, but many are just thieves. They see gold and they take it. one-sided report uh, prepared by a partisan committee. The White Helmets have shown Steve's... Uh, a large part of the evidence of the close relationship between that uh, fake group, uh, which is... There is a real Syrian civil defence group. It's linked into the international network of civil defence groups. They're five brigade and so on. You can call them up. There's a number to call them up, for example. There's no number to call these people up. They're only there where the Al-Qaeda groups are, basically. Apparently they may have reappeared in Idlib recently, but that's because of the presence of the armed groups. So they're in Idlib, they've been in, in just where the armed groups are, basically. Um, and they've got over $100 million. They, I think their website still says that they're independent and nonpartisan and so on. By admissions of the UK government and the US government, they've got over $100 million in a fairly short period of time from those two governments alone. So we can't say they're an NGO, we can't say they're independent. And that there's a massive photo that they put a few here showing the individuals in those groups. And they're from pretty much all the armed groups. You can identify people from Jabhat al-Nusra, from Arash Sham, 
and from Jundal Aksa just went to Raqqa to join ISIS also. Whether they've taken Waikanis to, to Raqqa, I'm not sure, because generally speaking, you know, there's been this sort of attempt to separate ISIS from the other Al Qaeda groups and to try and massage the publicity about you know, the good Al Qaeda compared to ISIS, for example. So there's the humanitarian industry, and I'm, I'm sorry for taking it too long, but to say that I wanted to make the point that humanitarian war has a long colonial and near colonial history, and it needs strong ideological campaigns in the current era where international law basically bans intervention. There's got to be these extreme, extreme uh, pretexts, humanitarian or protective war on, on, on terrorism pretexts, to get around, to make people ignore the international law that's being breached. The human rights groups have been co-opted, the older ones in some cases, or created for the purpose. Some of them were created for the war, some of them are older ones which were co-opted. Um, human Rights Watch and Amnesty were the most prominent examples. Uh, and they've engaged in multiple fabrications in the wars of the 21st century. I'm I just going to say one other example which strikes me because I was dealing with Human Rights Watch well before the Arab Spring. In 2003, when the Bush administration and you know, unfortunately our government invaded Iraq, uh, Bush, you may recall, said the new US uh, national security policy identified over 60 countries which they might intervene in at any time. Cuba thought, whoops, we're next, you know, after Iraq. And so they arrested 70 odd spies or agents of the US who were being paid by a US government to overthrow the Cuban government. They arrested them. Massive human rights cry, uh, cry from Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. Amnesty International were, were there within 24 to 48 hours saying these were all prisoners of conscience and so on. Or they were charged by under an offence which any state would have used against people taking money from a program specifically to overthrow the government. Um, and at the same time, do you recall, the people were sent to Guantanamo, the, the bit of Cuba excised by the US, um, to house all those prisoners supposedly with no rule of law, no charges, whatever. It took Amnesty International over three years to say anything about those prisoners at all. But they were straight on to the Cuban ones who actually had a trial and a trial and a, uh, they were all released within a few years, but they had a charges in the trial, the ones in Guantanamo didn't have any charges at all. So it goes back across uh, many issues, the history of human rights rights and amnesty in this century. The principal aim is to disqualify resistance, to disqualify the Syrian people, the Syrian army can't defend their country because you know all they're doing is killing civilians for the last six years apparently even though every opinion poll shows that the, the vast majority of Syrians support their president, their government, and their army even more. I would say the army has over 90% support in Syria. Bashar has at least 70% according to the armed groups, according to Turkish surveys, according to NATO consultant surveys, and according to Syrian elections. Um, and no one really seriously can test that in the Western media show of the Syrian presidential elections in 2014. Um, Journalist asked me about this and he said um, they were all pressured to vote. I said, what about in Lebanon? What about in Lebanon? They stopped traffic in Beirut. They caused huge traffic jams in Beirut to vote for the president, the refugees there. So in spite of that, apparently, you know, um, the story that persists for six years, I mean, how stupid are we? How stupid are we to swallow this for over six years in the face of a huge amount of evidence? But the aim is to disqualify resistance to the strategy there. Um, I'm going to end there. Thank you very much for your patience.